Hi everyone again, it's Steve D'Alessandro here uh, in Services Marketing. Today we're looking at uh, service de development and delivery. So a really interesting part of services. Really, if you like, this is sort of the distribution part of, of services. I guess the first question is, well, who likes waiting for service? Very few people. And what you'll notice from uh, some data I collected a few years ago here, that waiting times vary between prospective customers and existing customers, up to 32 minutes with Origin Energy, through to Amy with no wait. And of course, these kinds of uh, metrics are often very important because consumers, consumers perceive that they are waiting long than they actually, longer than they actually have. So something simple like this shows the importance of uh, service delivery and development. Now, consumers don't just um, co um, consume or, or co-create is the, the modern language for it now, a core service. So, for example, uh, insurance. They may be using unrelated services like customer service, uh, bill paying, and so on. Uh, or in the case of a cruise ship, they may be using augmented services or supplementary services such as food, uh, accommodation, entertainment, as well as just the overall uh, core service, which is to go on a holiday. And this is really explained in how Carnival Cruises, um, with their core service here of escape and relax relaxation, how augmented service, core, sorry, supplementary services such as a kids club, a health spa and so on, and augmented services such as money exchanges, photography, loyalty schemes and on, on sh onboard shopping, as well as important things like security, um, also help deliver a service experience for, the, for consumers. Now distributing services through channels is obviously an important issue. So we can have the customer visit the service site or the service providers go to the customers and this provides a very nice, I guess, typology, which is shown in table 5.2. So in terms of going to the service organization, you've got concerts, local hairdressers, then you've got multiple sites, tax preparation, train services. Service comes to the customers, you've got kitchen renovations, uh, gardening services, mobile plate wash, and so on. Customer services remotely, you've got credit card companies, TV stations, uh, broadcast networks and telephone companies and mobile phone providers. So there are a number of ways that a service can be delivered to a consumer. Now, uh, obviously that's if we own the channel of distribution, or we own all the aspects of the service delivery mechanism. In many parts of Australia that isn't the case, and other models are, have been used in the past and are involving. One of these is franchising, which is really a con contractual arrangement of the delivery of services by a third party. So for example, McDonald's, H&R uh, Block are examples of services. Agents and brokers, more commonly than you, so you've got real estate agents, stock brokers, insurance brokers. So agents are intermediaries who act on behalf of a service organization and are authorized to make commercial agreements between the organization and its customers. Brokers on the other hand acts facilitates exchange between buyers and sellers. So agent, a real estate agent of course works for the buyer, uh, but a broker can work for both the buyer and the seller. And there are advantages and disadvantages of both these ways of delivering a service. So what are the advantages of franchising? Okay, well it provides a leveraged format, a much very quicker way of, of expansion and revenues basically because people buy into the business, so the franchisee is helping you grow uh, the business. It provides consistency of outlook, outlets if, if it's managed well. So um, other examples of franchising, of course, include what we see in, in uh, travel offices and so on. Um, some financial organizations use a form of franchising as well. The knowledge of the local markets, so the knowledge of the Bathurst market or the knowledge of the Brisbane market uh, is provided by the franchise, franchisee. And there's a shared financial risk and more working capital for the franchiser. So that's another example. It's a much better way, a much more efficient way to expand uh, delivery mechanisms. However, there are disadvantages. There's difficulty in maintaining and monitoring franchisees. You can have lots of um, items in contracts, but in the end, you're relying on people to follow those uh, agreements. 
Of course, in recent times, there have been high, highly publicised publicized disputes that arise between the franchisees and the franchises. Franchises would like as many franchises as possible. However, this dilutes the value of a franchisee's business. Quality can therefore be inconsistent uh, because of your relying on third parties to deliver a service. Customer relationships are, tend to be controlled by the franchisee rather than the franchisor. So uh, important customer relationships, if we look at uh, taxation or if we look at uh, um, services that might be provided in fast food, they are controlled by the customer, not by the franchisee. And if you ever see the um, movie about the development of, hate, of uh, the McDonald's franchise in America, you'll see what's meant by that. But franchises are important. They're worth about $128 billion in, the, in uh, the Australian economy. Okay, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of agents and brokers? Well, the advantages are it's cheaper. The possession of their, they have special skills and knowledge of various markets. So agents, of course, have good knowledge of the real estate market and they have good skills in closing deals. You get representation within markets that you may not be able to get to. So if you're part of a, if you have an agent uh, selling your house, you get representation these days on a national market. They've got not good knowledge of local markets. And you've got a choice of multiple services. So they may provide advertising support. Uh, they may provide even uh, support for the buyers to get finance to buy, um, to purchase your property. What are the disadvantages? Well, you've got a loss of control over pricing now which is handed over to the agent and agreements with the brokers, particularly brokers. Representation of multiple service pro uh, providers, of principles rather, brokers and agents are not always act in the seller's interest. Okay, so they're all about their transactions, their commissions, and that may not be the highest possible price or outcome for you. But many financial services such as stocks and insurance and of course, I've mentioned earlier, real estate are delivered by brokers. Now, a more recent uh, development in the distribution of services or the delivery of services is what we call the sharing economy. And this is related very much to, the, to an agent and broker's approach in providing access to services. And, and really, these, these organisations are facilitating the exchange. They don't own, own the service. And you're probably familiar with companies like Uber and Airbnb. Peer-to-peer -peer service transactions in a business model where neither company owns the services or uses a franchise system of delivery. So the Uber drivers, are, uh, Uber would argue that they're not employees, nor are they part of the franchise. The Airbnb, they don't own the, own the um, combination, they are just facilitating the exchange. But like all kinds of ways of delivering services, there are advantages and disadvantages. So there have been issues in, uh, with Uber, for example, in regulation tax compliance. They believe they're not offering services, so they shouldn't have to pay GST. And in the case of Airbnb, there have been some examples or issues of, of guest safety. Now, what are some ways that we can develop services? Well, there are different types of services services or processes what we can develop not all are brand to the are brand new innovations so we may for example have a style change might just change the corporate identity such as corporate uniforms refurbishment of branches branches redesign of websites and so on or we may add additional supplementary service that may not involve a redesign of the service process we saw that earlier with the example of Carnival Cruises, that there are a number of uh, additional services they could augment on their cruise ships, uh, which uh, can provide, uh, which is not a complete redesign. We may change the core values, um, such as a brand new service setting. Uh, we may redesign the facility. So here we're starting to redesign some of the core offerings of the service. Or we may re-engineer the process uh, this might be done by self-service technology. It could be done by information technology. In the case of Airbnb and Uber earlier, you see that the process delivering the service through the smartphone applications is an example of process development. 
Or we may develop new markets, such as the mix of target markets. So we might look at cruise ships for various uh, families, or we might look for singles. So often there are these cruises to nowhere, which are for single people. Or we might uh, look at the retiree market and so on. Or we might uh, distribute our service using different distribution channels. So for example, Sony Pictures might uh, currently distributes its movies by different channels, such as uh, Google Play. Now, um, the stages in service development for brand new to the world follow that of pretty much that of, um, of products. I guess the major dif differences here is that services are much harder to evaluate prior to purchase, so that there really is quite a lot of aspect that would take place in the service development and testing. Now, okay, so we've got a service, but people wait for the service, and you might think, well, that's a good thing, where demand is greater than supply. However, um, not, people don't like waiting. If people give up waiting, you've lost business. If you're an organisation like a hospital or, or an ambulance or a police service, you don't want people to wait really at all. But all organisations are constrained by available resources. So there must be some way that we have of, re, of, re, of managing reservations and queuing and waiting lines. So what are some of the approaches? Well, well, we'll talk about these broadly in the next few slides. We can use a different queue configuration. We'll talk about this in a minute. We can tailor the queuing system to different market segments. Um, obviously, if you think of a triage system in a hospital, in a way, uh, that's ta tailoring services to different groups. We can manage customer behaviour and perceptions of weights. So sometimes people perceive that they're waiting a lot longer than they actually are. So by making people comfortable, by letting them know where they are in the queue, this is another way of managing waiting lines. Installing some sort of reservation system so people obviously uh, can reserve a hotel room rather than all show up on the day and, and want a room. So we do that now with uh, airlines, with hotels and so on. We can redesign the service process to reduce the time of each transaction. So again, this is that can be done by, by things like uh, people ordering online, self-service technology. So what then are some of the queuing configurations? Well, we can just ask people to form an orderly queue, and that's a sequential, that's often called a sequential stage. If we uh, have multiple servers, so in the queue we would just have one, if we have multiple servers, really an extension of, of a single live service, we can use a parallel line to multiple servers, and you would have seen these at the airport. And of course, airports have redesigned their service by having customers check in their baggage as a way of dealing with queues. Designated lines, as you can see here down the bottom with the Commonwealth Bank, is where we have lines for particular service types of inquiries, such as home loans, opening new accounts, investment advice, and so on. Take a number is another way. This is a plan ahead uh, reservation system that you would have been familiar with. Waitlists are a bit more complicated, and these are on the next slide. Waitlists are commonly used in restaurants and hospitalities as a way of, of catering with demand being greater than available supply of a service. Now remember, services are perishable, we can't really store them, so this is why queuing becomes more important in these areas. Now there are four different, four common means of waitlisting. So number of people are matched to the to type, so with party size to seating. VIP, people with special rights, frequent flyers and business class or celebrities and restaurants are served first. Call ahead seating, so those who've booked uh, by the internet, telephone, to hold a place in a wait list can use, so, and we can use SMS messaging to show where you are in the queue and large party reservations. So these are all very useful ways of managing queue configurations. Now, of course, queuing systems, as I said a bit earlier, can be tailored to different market segments. And this could be the urgency of the job, okay, the triage kind of approach, the duration of the service transaction. So this is where we would use different service lines. Payment of a premium price. So whether you want to, obviously airlines do this. If, you, if I book an airline tomorrow to go to 
Adelaide will be more expensive than if I book it for a month. So I'm paying a premium price because I, I don't want to queue and wait till next month. And of course, the importance of the customer. So in terms of relationship marketing, in terms of um, um, large organisations, large seedings, we'd use a different queuing system. So for example, if, you ever, if you're ever lucky enough to go on a trip to Europe, I'd recommend you join a tour group when you go to some of the museums because as a group they're more important and they're often ahead of the queue. Now perceptions of waiting time need to be managed because people believe that they wait longer for a service than they actually do. Believe that time passed seven times more slowly than it actually did with public transport. Must have been waiting for a Sydney train. Reservation strategies should also focus on yield. Many organisations use a percentage of capacity as a measure of organisational efficiency. So you've got things like load factors, occupancy rates in hotels. And the key is there's only so many rooms and so what organisations do is manage their accommodation according to um, uh, having so more upmarket or making sure that they might offer discounts when uh, things are a bit slower. So hence the development of a lot of these online hotel applications. You should also create alternatives for otherwise wasted capacity. For example, you might use the fact that you are not busy or you might use the fact that you are a popular restaurant for service differentiation. You might reward your best customers with loyalty schemes to um, get them to use the service a bit more. Uh, otherwise wasted capacity could be used for tour groups or travel agents to come and visit your hotel um, and that is another way of developing channels and customers. Rewarding employees by having them stay in your hotel or use your, your airline services. Some organisations uh, will barter for, for wasted capacity. So for example, a hotel may trade services with its, with its advertising supplier. So they might offer free rooms to somebody who is providing advertising support to them. So you can see this capacity argument is really very much also about operational efficiency as well. That's it for now. Obviously there is a lot more that I could talk about here, uh, but please consult your, your online topics and your textbook for more information. Thank you for listening.